Hi from snowy Denver. I'm Virginia Spielman. I'm the Associate Director of STAR Institute at SPD. And we're doing part two today, which is great, of the Managing Challenging Behaviours um, trilogy that we are um, discussing. And what we're really trying to do here is talk about how we can help our children and our young people be successful um, and what we can do to support them directly and also to help the whole team really support our children in a way that sets them up for success. It helps them process and learn. So there are a couple of things we need to think about when we are addressing what we might call challenging behaviors. Um, one of them is, is this really a challenging behavior? Is a question we really need to ask ourselves. So what I'm not talking about here are necessarily some of the self-soothing behaviors that people might feel personally to them as disruptive, but is actually functional for the child. So what I mean by that might be hand flapping or um, not giving eye contact. In, in, from, the, from the lens that I use, I really don't see those as challenging behaviors. Often those are behaviors that help an individual or child feel organized, feel grounded, and we need to find a different way of supporting that young person to be successful in the school environment. So we're not talking about challenging behaviors as behaviors that we want to stamp out, that we feel uncomfortable with. This isn't about normalization. This is more about aggressive behaviors, behaviors where a child gets stuck, behaviors where a child is being um, unkind or dangerous in their space. Um, and so we first ask ourselves really before we even implement something like this, is this really actually a challenging behavior that needs support? Um, and then the other thing that we were thinking about is what's the cause of the behavior? And we talked last time about the iceberg and looking under the surface at what's really, really going on here um, rather than just trying to address the behavior, the thing that we see at the top. The principles that we're talking about today, they come from some books that I want to make sure I acknowledge. Um, a lot of this comes from this book by Diane Cullinane, Behavioral Challenges in Children with Autism and Other Special Needs. It's a fantastic book, it's a developmental approach, and the three steps that we're gonna talk about today really directly come from here, and I love this approach. Um, we're also talking a lot from um, Dr. Greenspan's work and there's this great book by Greenspan and Brazelton about the irreducible needs of children which has some nice comments in it on why we look at foundations for success first uh, and also the need for structure. There is a need for structure, there is a need for set clear expectations and boundaries so that book's really great. And then finally a lot of the words that I use also come from Stuart Shanker's self-reg book which I adore and um, share all the time on social media. So I just wanted to make sure I acknowledge those before we really go on to thinking about, okay, here's a child with some challenging behaviors and maybe this is a child who is acting out in school. This is a child who is breaking other people's uh, projects, uh, knocking over other people's constructions and so on. And what are we gonna do to help that child? And there's three basic steps in the moment. I'm just gonna introduce them today and then we're gonna go into more depth in part three. That's what part three is gonna be about. The first step in the moment of helping a child is just to attune to the child's experience. So you just put on the brakes a little bit as the grown up helper and you ask yourself what is really going on. You try to broaden the view you have of the child beyond the behavior that we're seeing that we're trying to support, um, we're trying to change or shape, perhaps we might use that word. So we're just gonna say what is going on here and then we're gonna help that child get organized. We're gonna help that child get into a more functional zone again. So we talk about attuning, um, and organizing. And then the second step is going to be helping that child to sort of recover back to where they're able to function. We're going to help move them up the developmental ladder again. And then finally, that's when we come to a genuine resolution of the event. So this is quite different to the way that oftentimes we, we deal with behaviors in the moment. We get stressed, the child gets stressed. We quickly want them to resolve the behavior and say sorry. And we might, we, we might think we need to punish them and put them in a timeout. And again, 
just thinking about where we're coming from with this kind of developmental approach. What we're really looking for is, to, is, is discipline as a teaching tool. And these opportunities of challenging behaviours as teaching moments for our child. And punishment really takes away that teachable aspect. And so, so when we go through these three steps, we're opening ourselves back up to how can we help the child learn from this and move on from this so that it becomes a tiny bit easier for them next time rather than just punishing them so that they don't do it because they're afraid of being punished. We want them to understand better ways of dealing with the way that they're feeling, better ways of dealing with the frustrations of social interaction and so on. So, so these are, this is about teaching, it's about helping and supporting as we go through. And then we really want them to understand, you know, well, why we say sorry. We want them to want to apologize. We want them to want to repair their relationships and have that theory of mind, that mentalization of the other person's experience. So this is the perspective that we're coming from as we go through these three basic steps of attuning and organizing, helping, and then finally resolution and resolving. And that might come much later in our children. And, I, and I, it reminds me of um, Daniel Siegel's work where he talks about a child flipping their lid. And he talks about how the downstairs brain, when it gets dysregulated um, and we get into a real state of high arousal and our, our heart is beating really fast, we might go red in the face, you know, we get mad, we get upset, whatever. The, the upstairs brain really goes offline. So we kind of, the, the, the lid comes off and all of this great neural real estate up here, it's no longer available to us. And we start being driven and run by the downstairs brain. And so we can't expect resolution with a child. We can't go straight to step three with a child whose upstairs brain is completely unavailable. We're trying to be logical with someone who has gone very limbic, who has gone into very high arousal. And that means that they're really just kind of that emotional place and they might have even gone lower than that. So we help our children recover as one of the first things that we do is we want to take the time that their body and brain needs to take to recover, to be integrated again so that they can get to that place of logical reflection. So we're talking about regulation. We're talking about helping our children recover. We're talking about helping them get back to their baseline and then teaching them incrementally to become more sophisticated in the way that they deal with challenges so that we don't get the behaviors that are disruptive, disorganizing, upsetting, and sometimes dangerous. These are the principles we're operating from as we talk about managing challenging behaviors like this. And I hope this has been a helpful discussion for you. Let us know what you want to talk about more in part three, but really what we'll do is we'll go into detail about each of these steps, attuning and organizing, helping and resolving.